guess it's, it's unique drop uh, headband drum. You, you gave one of our team members, uh, Rebecca, who wants to get on team like you. Okay, I think we can start. Hi, Kate. Can you hear us? Hi, guys. Yes, Hi. I can hear you. Hey, it's it's virtual Kate. <laughs> it's virtual Kate. Okay. Um, thank you so Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here. Very excited about this panel. Um, we're going to be speaking generally about the disruption of the art market within the NFT space. I have uh, the pleasure of being here with Kate Vass, co-founder and uh, CEO of Kate Vass Gallery, with Jason Bailey, most known maybe as Art Gnome, and with Ryan Roybal from uh, the Mint Lab. Uh, so I'll introduce myself first and then I'll let the panelists say a little bit about, about them and then we'll go straight into it. So my name is Mikol. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Vertical Crypto Art. Uh, we're a studio uh, dedicated to web-free and blockchain art, uh, doing curatorial advisory and, and education uh, in the space, primarily dedicated to artists. And I'll let Kate introduce herself. Hello guys, I'm happy to see everyone. Thank you very much, Nicole, for inviting me. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to travel and my travel plans have been cancelled last minute. So I apologize, but I'm very happy I can join online. Um, shortly about myself, my name is Kate Vass. I'm a founder and creative director of Kate Vass Gallery, headquartered in Zurich, Switzerland. And we are the um, kind of physical gallery, one of the pioneering ones for focusing on art and technology. Uh, since 2017, hosting all the pioneering exhibitions like uh, Perfect and Priceless, um, Artificial Intelligence, working with Jason Bailey um, for curatorial projects uh, since 2018. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's a short uh, bio. Awesome. Thank you. Jason? Uh, hi, everybody. Can, can everyone hear me? It's a little weird with the headphones in. This is good volume. Yeah. So I'm Jason Bailey, uh, known as Art Gnome. I'm a big art nerd, uh, really into anything at the intersection of art and tech. I've been writing the blog artgnome.com for about five years. Was a, a really early collector in NFTs. Um, in late 2017, I, I wrote a lot of early articles about where I thought uh, blockchain and art could go um, and kind of lucked out and a lot of those predictions kind of came true. Um, so now this year, after having done a bunch of different um, cool explorations within the art and tech space, started a new company called Club NFT. Um, and that is because as one of the earliest collectors, I realized there were a lot of infrastructure problems and security problems around NFTs that aren't fully solved yet that we've, we've had um, in this space for years and years. And we're seeing marketplaces take off and buying and selling take off, but a lot of the less sexy problems haven't really been solved yet. So you know, we're building some of these backup protection style solutions for collectors so that they can have more confidence in the space and we can bring on more collectors and bring on more artists. But nice to see you all today. Awesome. I didn't know we had so much time to introduce ourselves. Otherwise, I would talk about myself a little bit longer, Jason. <laughs> Was that too long? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Ryan. Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Roybal. I, can you hear me all right on here? Okay. Yeah, so... Um, I'm coming in from Berlin, Germany. Um, been working out here in New York for a bit. Uh, we just set up uh, the Mint Lab in the last few months and um, kind of working on bridging the gap between the digital and the physical spaces uh, within the NFT space and uh, really working on the artist uh, component, uh, especially giving this decentralized space the opportunity for artists to monetize on their works and have their pieces known for what they're doing. So very important uh, integral element, I think, to uh, blockchain technology. So um, a few other projects we're working on as well. Um, a little bit of metaverse architecture company where we're kind of focused on uh, building out in different metaverses and also creating experiences through IRL and digital experiences to kind of extend the narrative uh, through the artist's intention. So um, we're just looking at all the new methodologies that can be implemented with uh, blockchain technology and just really trying to um, empower the creatives and see uh, where we're going with this uh, future in the, ne the next century, let's say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I guess we can start with the big kind of underlying thing that we're at Art Basel and we're speaking about NFTs. And this is probably the first time it happened. Um, so I'd like to ask you, and I'll start with Kate, 
uh, we're seeing a trend of the art market and especially the buyers of the art market being led by younger generations who are buying through digital mediums. How do you see that as a disruption of the traditional art market? I'm not sure I understand the question because the new generation uh, of collectors, you mean, that they started to collect uh, or the new generation? Yes. What? Okay, yeah, but I'm not sure it's disruptive. I mean, it's cool that new generation uh, is interested in art. Uh, new generation collects and looks at arts differently. And this is what we experienced already for the last um, three, four, five years, actually. You know, it it's didn't happen uh, recently. Um, and uh, with the introduction of technology uh, for the last uh, couple of years, you know, with the boom uh, caused by partially by COVID as well, um, we, we see the more people going online. And I think naturally the new generation is more kind of um, tech savvy and, uh, and they are more uh, tech advanced and using all these tools, you know, maybe that's why we also see more people, more young, younger people, let's let's assume, you know, using this technology and also looking and browsing through the internet, collecting NFTs, because they are uh, initially, you know, more natural to these kind of tools, right? And uh, when they, we compare with a more traditional elder generation who have uh, no experience sometimes with the computers or we had people helping them out, you know, with, the, with the, I don't know, some basic things, you know, or uh, they have a family office set up where they have a bunch of people hired working for them. They just didn't, they didn't, didn't know, they didn't even um, had to use this sort of tools, right? And that's why it's a little bit more complex, you know, for them to get to know, uh, first of all, of uh, all this technology, e even internet and spend time in there, you know. Um, but I think, you know, it, there was also a slight shift uh, towards the last year that they see more and more traditional art collectors uh, collecting a lot, collecting a very good uh, artworks. And uh, it's it's not only younger generation, which is actually good, um, because I mean the gallery was focusing uh, since the beginning on the younger generation because nobody wanted to kind of um, compete with other traditional art galleries, um, and this sort of art that we're focusing on, generative art, is mostly common for either tech related people because they are used to uh, used to it and they understand the tools. Uh, or to a younger generation that they, they can relate to. And most importantly, they were able to collect this sort of art because it was cheaper, right? If you want to establish some sort of um, museum quality collection uh, for the contemporary artwork, um, it's almost impossible. You have to be a billionaire and majority of the good pieces, they are all taken away by the private collections or established the museums and, and institutions. And even if you have uh, the, let's say, financial power to acquire one, you also have to wait in line for the 10 years or so minimum, you know, like to actually get whitelisted to, uh, to, to acquire this work for your collection. When, uh, you know, photography was more or less uh, the, the, the um, alternative for the younger generation to start their collection, to make a difference, uh, and to be able to still collect more or less with the good quality vintage works, even though photography was also kind of divided market for, for the last uh, 20 years. Um, yeah, I mean, with a new introduction of generative art, of digital art, and particularly with the trend of NFTs, I think it's just been accepted by younger generation because it's also was affordable. Jason? Yeah, I mean, I think it is actually really disruptive and it's sort of disruptive by design. So um, if you go back to four years ago, five years ago, when people were trying to think about what the blockchain and art opportunity could be, a lot of it was designed to try to build something that was more inclusive and broader that people could feel like they could participate in. I think ex exclusivity was sort of core to the identity of the traditional art market and art world for, for decades. And uh, a lot of younger folks that wanted to, to have a more inclusive approach initially went down that path of is, this, uh, is there a way we can make art more approachable to both artists and collectors? What remains to be seen is whether or not we've actually accomplished anything on that front. I think with every year that passes, um, this new art world that we're trying to build looks more and more just like the old art world. So I guess I would leave it at that. Yeah, I think that there's a couple elements that are also like, like 
building into the NFT space and the crypto crypto art world is the fact of like community and the youth. And I think the youth element is really bringing a lot of fresh ideas and fresh approaches to the actual creation of artwork. And that with the technology, we're having that ability to start to have multiple avenues of expressing the artist's in, uh, creative intentions, maybe through a digital piece or through a physical piece. And then else the conduit between those being like the digital communities that are also being formulated between these. I think it's really starting to unlock like an extra layer of how people can communicate and others can actually understand or feel or connect with the artwork from the creator's original intent. And on that point about connecting with the artwork, I think actually it leads me to the next question, which is about displaying artwork and galleries and how that model is maybe shifting. Uh, and what are your thoughts on that? And what is what is the future? What does the future entail for gallery models? Maybe Kate, you can start us off with this. I think we've seen uh, most recently many many uh, NFT exhibitions. You know where majority of the artworks they just uh, displayed on the TV screens or more or less advanced uh, hardware. You know like LED screens uh, and building installations. And uh, those kind of exhibitions, to me, they look kind of repetitive, even though I do understand that there is no maybe better alternative way of uh, how to display digital art. But maybe, you know, like also in metaverse, you know, it's, I mean, versus physical spaces, you know, where we have more fun and also more experiences. Um, um, yeah, building this artistic uh, kind of rooms, you know, where people at least can interfere with the artworks on a different level, not just by looking at the screen, you know, um, in sense of a physical space, but they can actually, uh, you know, walk around as an avatar, you know, wearing all these VR sets and stuff like that. So it becomes more interactive and it's and it's a different level of how you uh, relate to the artwork as well. Um, what I think is also interesting that... Um, I think you know the the artist is uh, the key element here, right? And uh, the, the 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 whole uh, revolution of uh, of the last uh, five years, you know, when this uh, blockchain uh, uh, technology was introduced, you know, that um, the artist has been uh, able to receive this uh, secondary uh, secondary market royalties. And I think you know when we build up the exhibition, maybe it would be really nice to 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 see the artist as a key player there and that's what i'm missing when i see majority of the exhibitions i mean we see multiple multiple screens and um okay some sort of uh, animated or still images moving around and then we see like some sort of qr little qr code next to it and then you have to struggle and, and, and scan it and then if you really wish to kind of insist you like a collector you know to to find out more about this piece then you kind of dig in and find the information and i think this is what i'm missing the link to the creator because the creator is number one now and if uh, I if I do the, the exhibitions you know I want to see the artists present I want to communicate with them not only by Twitter account you know like in the virtual space but also physically um, so I would really advise everyone who was uh, who plans to, to exhibit in the future you know please invite the artists uh, make it around them um, and and I think that at least will make a difference how you exhibit the artworks because I mean if you don't find a better way how to display it rather than this just a digital screen maybe the artist can add up a value you know to the experience that uh, the collector will have absolutely ryan yeah i mean i can really connect with this i feel like this is basically one of the fundamentals of what we're doing all here is because as creators and artists i think that uh, ultimately it's about people connecting with your work it's not that everyone has to connect with it but um, ultimately, there are some people that will connect deeper than others. And uh, exactly going back to what Kate was just mentioned about that experience and the displays and the options that we have, um, there's many factors out there that we can take into consideration. Um, just to speak briefly about an exhibition that we had uh, in Brooklyn about two months ago, it's called Influences. And we, uh, we brought up four artists from uh, the Tezos blockchain to create uh, artwork proprietary to the technology that we had which was a 65 foot by 14 foot LED wall that had a very high end th uh, 3D technology behind it. So actually the artwork came about 10 feet out from the screen. So um, the first day that we had the show, the audience was sort of sitting there just observing this, the, the artwork and the, and the exhibition. But by day two, we saw that people were kind of urging to like become part of the work. So 
Um, the second day, we asked people to actually start walking into the artwork. And this was the magical moment where people were having this aha moment where they were connecting deeply into what the artist had intended to. And it was something that was really magical. And um, it's just, I feel that we're just on the cusp of merging the technology with the artist's intent. And this is one of those very special moments. Actually, that's a good point. I think I had a conversation like yesterday about this specifically, and somebody was asking me, but how do you, I, how do I experience the artwork? Like, where do you see it? Do you see it on your phone? Do you see it on the laptop? And actually what you're saying, Ryan and Kate as well, it's, there's much more than just the screen. The, the part of digital art is the whole immersive experience that's built into it, which is, uh, you know, exciting and interesting. Um, and on that, how, What, what, do you, what do we think are, especially like looking at kind of culture and like this new wealth that is being generated by young creators and collect, young collectors as well that want to experience the art exactly how you were saying, Ryan, what are some of the ways in which that is possible uh, for galleries, for curators, for people who are interested in displaying uh, NFTs or digital art as, as it should be? Uh, Jason, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably not the best one to answer this question, but I'll throw sort of my, my thoughts out there in that um, I think we're in an awkward transitional phase where people are treating digital art like a painting. Like, we just look around us in this room, right? Like, we're used to paintings hanging on a wall, so that's how we're starting to display them. But the way I look at it, uh, most of us spend most of our days with our eyes in front of our laptops, our cell phones, our TVs, right? We, we don't necessarily have to have something that kind of is a, a throwback to the, the old world of paintings and things that hang on the wall. My eyes are already on my screens, not on my walls, right? That said, there was like the Rafik Anadol um, giant screen on the beach last night um, that was like a gorgeous, you should all check it out, this gorgeous, really cool experience. But we're not going to have that in our lives every day. So there's this sort of difference between um, a gallery style exhibit or a public artwork that can actually do some really interesting things in terms of presentation and then just getting comfortable with the fact that we already live in, in hyper digital worlds and our eyes are already on screens. Um, and that's a perfectly fine way to consume a lot of art. Kate, do you have anything to add on this? Well, I think, you know, yes, it depends. I agree with Jason. It depends on uh, if it's a public installation and you have a public funding for, for um, organizing a show, you know, like where you have uh, no limits to your imagination, let's put it that way, you know, and you can really build something like Refik Anadol, amazing, amazing work. I unfortunately, I'm not uh, there physically to visit it, but I've been watching online. And still it's fascinating even, even by just, you know, uh, from, uh, from looking at this uh, on the screen. Um, but uh, if, it's a, if it's a gallery, imagine, you know, the space is limited, all right? We are still in the kind of uh, physical uh, bricks and mortar walls and we can't uh, expand it. I mean, what we can do probably is to start interacting with the collectors and play around building the connection between the artwork and the collector before the exhibition maybe you know like uh to to build up some education or maybe you know like just to give an example of kevin abosh for example work you know that he did amazing you know uh where he questions if uh artwork collects you you know because um the relationship between the art and the and the collector also changed um, you know, these sort of things, you know, like uh, try to be creative uh, as a gallery because the, the sources uh, to build up some major exhibitions or, for example, like Ryan says, you know, it's amazing, but it's also very cost. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's costly, it's expensive and not everybody can allow themselves, you know, to build up such a great, beautiful LED Uh, installation and build up all these experiences. If you're a museum uh, and you have a Kusama exhibition, of course, you also, uh, you know, have always different experiences. So I think it depends on the budget, depends on the idea, depends on the angle of the, of the show. Um, but I think, you know, what we should not forget is just, you know, try to be uh, creative in the, in the terms of trying to, to bring some added value to the collector, to the audience, you know, uh, from the educational 
emotional point of view and from the interaction point of view. And that's the crucial part. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you have, right? Or if you uh, if you do it in the smaller space or you, or you do it publicly. Um, I think the most important is still to stay uh, from the curatorial side, creative. Not just, you know, like to, to exhibit screens and uh, hang around and let people walk and they don't really pick up the knowledge from this, you know. Absolutely. And actually on this point, um, we talked, you just mentioned like education. And I think um, one of the, still the skepticism of NFTs, especially within the traditional art world is what exactly am I collecting? What exactly am I buying? Who are these artists that are selling sometimes, especially if we look at the media for it, a lot of money? Um, how do you think that gap which still exists between the traditional art market and this digital blockchain-based art is filled, if it has to be filled, or will it always be kind of different and, and a divide, let's say? Um, anyone can take it, Kate or Jason? We made it to Art Basel. Hello, guys. You know, I remember in 2018 <laughs> when I was inviting people, please, let's arrange a talk around art and tech. We were outside. We were not allowed inside. And with all the respect to our puzzle, I love our puzzle, but we were outside in 2018. We were outside in 2019. But in 2021, we are accepted and we are having this panel. So I think there is a chance, and I'm always thinking very positive, that we are, you know, art is art. We are all here for the creativity. So I don't think we should really reach you know and, and bring this build this uh, walls between uh, one sort of art and another sort of art i mean again i just bring the photography it was not accepted as fine art 45 years ago but over the time you know time and patience makes a trick so i think here we are also just at the roots of uh, of a, the new different types of era and um yeah this is my opinion i don't know guys what do you think yeah, I mean, when you look back, digital art, um, and I always think about generative art, but digital art and generative art going back to like the 1960s, right, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, the art world was always pretty cold towards digital art and treated them as outsiders. It took a long, long time to see any progress on that front. So while the progress feels slow, in these last two, three years, this might be like the most progress we've seen in this space in terms of the art world embracing um, digital art. But I think what you're talking about, Nicole, is sort of this knowledge gap and, and, you know, for a while we were dragging everyone that was interested in NFTs, we would drag them through all the technology. And we'd be like, so there's this thing called the blockchain and blah, blah, blah. And by the time you got to like, you know, an hour later, you start talking about art. And I think people glaze over. So we just need to get better at starting at like the cool parts of NFTs. Like, hey, like anyone can collect from anywhere. And like, you know, it's just like a really exciting way to start as a collector with lower barriers. And then when people have interest, then you can start to bring them into the more technical stuff if they care right but with like other technologies we don't like when you go to hop online and look at a website we don't make you listen to two hours of an explanation on how the internet works right so i think we just need to figure out ways to make this fun and enjoyable and accessible and less intimidating because i think that's what the space should be about definitely well put i think that's an integral component because like like you said it's an extremely technical aspect to this whole this whole space that we're in right now and i think a lot of the times when we sit down and start starting off with the technical aspects people we completely lose them so it's really about us to have that empathy to understand our audience. And uh, I think this also translates directly into the educational component. Because um, if you look at both, both sides right now, I think we have our very like, contemporary traditional art world, and now we have our digital natives. And these are two very separate camps. And uh, cross-pollinating between both of them, it's not a one-way road. You have to understand the other side's perspective so that we can then communicate it in a way that, like Jason mentioned, is something that's palatable by others. So I think this is kind of like that creative moment where we have to like, as creatives, take that step back and be like, okay, well, how can we have fun with this? Yeah, it's this huge technical giant, but in the end, we just want to be playful. Like lowering the barrier to entry and just talking about the art first and then everything else that comes with it, maybe. Yeah. Um, and actually on this, especially for collectors that are trying to get into NFTs or would like to collect digital art, there's a lot out there. 
a lot, like OpenSea, um, you know, marketplaces that are that are open, even gated marketplaces, curated marketplaces are hard to navigate. What are ways in which new collect new digital art collectors or people that are interested in acquiring NFTs can look out for? And uh, what does what role does curation play into this as well? Uh, Kate. Well, I think, you know, for the new collectors, it's really overwhelming. It's a lot of information, many, many platforms. You're getting super confused as soon as you start looking. Um, and I think, you know, now it's even more. Again, before it was like a couple of platforms and you uh, log into these platforms and you start browsing and you get yourself familiar with, uh, with the majority of the artists quite quickly. You know, after a couple of months, you already could... Uh, um, get familiar with majority of the artists on Super Rare, for example, because there were not so many um, at the very beginning. And uh, and you just, uh, and I think this is how a uh, majority of old collectors, you know, benefit uh, from the direct relationships also since uh, 2017, 2018 uh, with artists. But now it's very complicated. I think, you know, you need definitely uh, some sort of special guidance, uh, like uh, uh, either the expert who, who relates to uh, NFTs uh, since, uh, it's the, since, since the beginning, uh, who understands the space, or, you know, what I see from many established collectors, you know, they just hire the team, hire the analytics, hire the people who actually monitor and screen Twitters and <laughs> all the Insta stories, uh, monitor also the marketplaces and really, really make the job, you know, by screening and screening and screening uh, millions of artworks, you know, just to, to find the right one. And if you are not a collector who has a team working for you, and you're just one uh, person that you wish to start, I guess, you know, the better way to do it is, of course, you know, just uh, to get familiar with the, with the places that are credible, galleries, marketplaces, uh, look at the panels, look at the, uh, what um, the specialist in the sector uh, refer to, probably, you know, like, uh, look at the Jason Bailey, <laughs> what he collects, everybody does. <laughs> Um, uh, or somebody else, you know, also this kind of social collecting, social investing, social collecting also became very relevant recently. Uh, or, I don't know, uh, whatever you like, you know, and relate to and uh, you um, have emotional connection to, you know, this is how you should collect probably, not because of the reasons to, uh, to benefit or uh, invest and profit and flip. Uh, that's what we see most of the time. But uh, actually, if you're really there for the art, uh, the, the right artwork will find you very, very easily. Jason? Yeah, I, I actually always say the same thing on this because I think it's it's fairly decent advice, which is because uh, people are like, well, what about people that buy NFTs and then if the market crashes or whatever? And my, my general advice is, Buy art that you really love from artists that you want to see succeed for prices that you can afford with the assumption that you'll never be able to resell it and you'll always be happy. You can't go wrong, right? So literally come in and just spend what you can afford, fall in love with some work. You can't really make mistakes because you're going to love that work later. And then when you want to get more serious, there are a great, so early on we thought we were going to cut out all the, the middlemen, just like Bitcoin wanted to get rid of all the banks. We thought we'll get rid of the gallerists and the curators, but we're actually seeing years out that we need those people more now than ever, right? So start just by kind of going in and exploring and buying what you like, but then there are great resources like Kate and other people that have been in this space for a long time Time. If you want to spend a little bit more or learn a little bit more about the space, there are people that are more than happy to, to kind of help you walk you along uh, in that process. But I would say don't overthink it, don't overspend, don't assume you're going to get rich, buy art you love. Yeah, and I think, you know, just, you know, to identify the reason why you are collecting, why are you in this space? If your reason is really collecting art, this is definitely, I agree with Jason, just collect what you like and you can afford. But there, unfortunately, they are not always uh, the same reason that people have when they start going to the space. And let's see. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. I, to piggyback on kind of what you guys had previously mentioned about, like, just collect what you love, which I think should be the ethos as most people bring with themselves when they do decide to start collecting NFTs. And... Um, just to discuss a little bit more about like the depth that I think we have uh, or the ability that we have to build on this depth is that we now can start to create more of a, um, 
let's say like a community that's based around, I mean, we've been talking about communities a lot, but I think that uh, there's a lot of more or different aspects that we can look at into creating one particular art or collecting one particular artist's works. Um, so we can, you know, pass to you to kind of look into like where maybe a Picasso, how they, how he collaborated with Van Gogh or something like that. But we can also start to see these same elements within the NFT space. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of history and understanding of like where these artists came up. And especially like the technological aspect, I think that um, both Kate and Jason are very aware of like, like the GAN based art that's being created now with the technology. And I think this is one of these new proprietary texts that are being enveloped into the artwork that's now being created. So it gives the audience and the collectors a bit more depth to the artists and their work and they can kind of see like a track record of where they're developing this, their next pieces and something that might actually connect to the collector like it hasn't happened in the, in the past, let's say. On this point, um, what do you think is the role of the collector, the curator, sorry, in the space? And will it be different or is it just very similar to what we're seeing in the traditional art market? What are curators in the blockchain art space and what, how is their role different or maybe not? I'm, I'm happy to take the first to take the first swing, I guess. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's a part of this whole movement is that everybody gets to become a curator. And like, I think it was a panel I did in New York where I was talking about how, you know, maybe the new expertise, instead of curators kind of talking unidirectionally to people and remaining like the established expert, it's more bi-directional and conversational and passing that knowledge on to people. But then I was called paternalistic for saying that. So I think we're trying to figure out how to get comfortable with this idea that everybody can participate, but there still is such a thing as expertise and context. And like, you know, I, I think I'm very thankful for the teachers and educators and art historians and, and people that have really helped me along my journey to see art uh, beyond just what's on the surface and give context. And I hope that that doesn't die and it's it's not seen as something that like just disappears because it really does enrich um, sort of your the way that you can experience artists and in you know the ability to talk to somebody that maybe does have a little understanding more understanding and experience and how that fits in sort of the entire history of art and, and you know uh, digital art so that's I guess that's where I land yeah definitely it's like, but that's the community aspect like I think um, it's about like understanding people with the knowledge like yourself who've been in the space for since its inception almost. And it's like you carry this knowledge with you that people who are looking into the collectors or creators that came from that era or that period, it's then resonating through the work and maybe a newer creator might see something in that and start to take that torch and move forward with it. And then that's like that lineage that could be built into the artist. So I think that's, yeah, just to, to confirm what you're saying, I think that's a great aspect to see it. I want to know what Kate thinks. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what Kate thinks. Um, uh, well, honestly, like I think the, the 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 meaning of curator should not be underestimated, right? Um, it, it's still you are playing a very crucial role here, and and the curator part of the job of the curator is actually also again, sorry to be boring, to educate through their show that he's or she is curating right and if there is no peace of mind that the collector kind of can collect you know while looking at this exhibition experiencing this exhibition and he just exits the door and says well i didn't understand anything i can do better or i i can draw better or i can i i i, I have the same gpack at home you know like um, this is a bad curatorial work for me you know like if the person came out from the show and 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 says oh Gosh, you know, it's it's uh, full of bullshit. Sorry for my English. You know, like uh, I can't. Uh, we 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 don't understand why is it in the museum, why is it in the gallery, and why all this hype is about. You know, but if actually people can uh, pick up some knowledge and and learn something new and experience something fresh and uh, that they get excited about, and then then they continue learning themselves, even maybe not at the show. That's a good curatorial work. I mean, I already give a credit to that because at least least something at least little bit was achieved so yeah mentioned if if okay. if some if some some of the curators can can do that and there there are people like that you know i totally support them and i i think we do need those people in the space but unfortunately there are not so many uh the good ones 
You mentioned uh, education a couple of times. I think actually it's quite an important part of this, everything we're living now, and maybe something that doesn't get as much as attention as it should, uh, especially from like a lector point of view. Like I think, Jason, what you're doing with uh, club NFTs is definitely an example of educating collectors into what they are acquiring and what is an NFT and what is the technology that lies behind it. I know we said we don't have to be too technical, but maybe we can, for the purpose of this panel, like understand exactly um, you know, what you're doing with club NFTs and also how important is collector education in exactly the token and what you're going into when you're acquiring one. Sure, yeah, I'm going to resist the urge to get super nerdy. I'm going to try to keep it high level and short so I don't uh, take over here. But um, I, I put a tweet out, a survey that asked, like, you know, what percentage of people do you think actually understand what they're buying when they buy an NFT? And, like, something like 80% of people said that, like, people have no clue what they're buying when they get an NFT, right? So that you, we hear this talk about the blockchain chain and like things can live on there forever and you never have to worry. But what people don't realize when they go to a marketplace and they look at all these images, dozens of images or videos, and they fall in love with those and they buy those, those things don't live on the blockchain. All those things that you hear that are wonderful about the blockchain, what you have is a token or a piece of code that lives on the blockchain. Typically, that points out with a link to uh, you know, the, the actual image files and metadata that live on IPFS. And that's being paid for usually by the marketplace, right? Or sometimes the artist. But if it's not being paid for by you as the collector, you don't really have control over that. Didn't matter three years ago when we were spending $10, $15 on these things. But now that they're selling for like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, you probably should like look a little bit deeper at what it is that you own. So super quick, the plug for Club NFT, we're working on a free tool where you don't have to pay us anything. We don't lock you in. We just give you control to download those assets locally so that you can restore them via IPFS. It'll start getting nerdy from there. But um, if you're interested, you can learn more at clubnft.com. Kate, um, when you are when you have like gallery shows, when you're approaching collectors, uh, how do you kind of, especially maybe like traditional collectors that want to get into like NFTs, how do you bridge that educational gap? And what are some of the things that uh, are important to you to educate people on? Well, I think you know I spent um, minimum two three hours by talking to each uh, collector individually. That's just explaining their basics you know like of how the, the whole thing works and uh, of course you know there are so many different technicalities you know that you have to um, eventually learn anyway so if you invest in this space if you invest in the art you know and if you're really serious about your collection eventually you will take your time to learn and to listen and to read and uh, use the <laughs> Uh, help of a club NFT uh, and other guys, you know, who, who kind of provide the service to to help you um, to help collectors, you know, to to store, to organize your collection, to understand more. But on um, our gallery shows, we always obviously, you know, always integrate educational sessions and always try to explain people, you know, what exactly we are showing, what we are selling how we are selling and uh, part of the gallery uh, job now, to be honest with you, like it's not only about technicalities of what NFT is and e, what's the difference between the token of uh, 1155 and 721, you know, like this is already like uh, only technical part. We are far away from this. We are educating now, okay, what's the currencies, you know, how you hedge yourself, you know, from taxation, AML, KYC, you know, how you store things, how you preserve your collection. Um, because what we've seen from with the museums, you know, who has been, for example, showing and uh, maintaining the archives of video files or some sort of techie uh, computer art from 90s, 80s, um, the problem that they have is storage, right? And the, the use of it, the technology go, goes develops very fast and you cannot really um use the same tools to exhibit it and to to maintain it so i think you know with our um technology what we have today in viewing rooms you know like OpenSea, for example where you can expose all your collections and nfts uh visually um uh, probably in 10 years we will have completely different uh 
interfaces, you know, different different companies also, maybe different currencies, or maybe we all live in the metaverse. I have no idea. But, you know, this, uh, the, the questions that you should not um, kind of push away, you know, when, once you enter the space to collect those uh, assets and also the regulations. Uh, so, yeah, the part of uh, my education and my conversation with collectors goes beyond just the technical uh, formalities. It's uh, the holistic more or less approach of how you look at your collection overall and how you manage it from all the sides, tech, finance, tax, uh, preservation, exhibition, uh, and, and, and then, you know, at the end of the day, try to enjoy it. <laughs> try to enjoy the art as well. Absolutely. I think you touched on so many different points that it has to be like a panel of its own to actually talk about all of all of what uh, you just you just said, Kate. I think we're coming up to the last five minutes and I actually wanted to uh, end with just a bit of a like a future outlook. Uh, obviously, we've seen a huge uh, influx in the NFT uh, market and space and blockchain art in the last year, 18 months. What uh, do you all three uh, expect or hope uh, that you know, where do you see the space evolving in the next six to, to 12 months? And I'll start with Ryan. Oh, all right. Six months. We have I, to keep it quite short, though. The, so this is going to be a tough one. Yeah. Uh, in six months, I think we're going to see a, a convergence where the technology, meaning like all the computer-aided, like AI-generative design, will start to take an over, like a little bit more presence than it has in the past. Um, there's been a lot of different types of artwork that have been evolving in the space. And I feel that the tech side is going to have a nice dance with the creative side at this moment. Jason? I think we'll see sort of a market crash. So we've had volatility in this space up and down for years, and people are buying way too much stuff that they don't actually want. Um, so it'll crash, it'll be healthy, we'll shake off a lot of the speculators, the people that actually care about making art and buying art will stick around. And when we come back out of that, um, we won't be talking so much about the tech and so obsessed with the NFT side of it. It'll just become natural to collect the art and we'll focus more on the art, less on the novelty. Um, so yeah, I fully expect a crash and I think it's healthy. I'm kind of looking forward to it. Great, Kate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with Jason um, on this one. Um, well, actually, there will be both. I think, you know, we will experience more and more um, NFTs, you know, in different types of sectors, not only art, you know, where it's relevant, like music, sports and gaming. Of course, you know, it's uh, it's uh, necessary to integrate those as well. Um, but at the same time, I, I think, you know, we will much sooner experience the, the correction, the heavy, heavy correction on the market. Um, there are very uh, few red flags already that indicate that we will have crash. Um, later, maybe June. <laughs> 2022. You, you can Let's give a specific date. Start puzzle. Puzzle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we are going to talk like if our predictions. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's good, you know, because it will eliminate a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of uh, people and collectors and uh, flippers and uh, irrelevant people, you know, who don't try to be there in the space for the art, but actually for other uh, worse reasons, you know. So it's actually always good, you know. It's cyclical. It's good. It's a healthy Life. direction. Yeah. Do you think awesome. it might open the barrier of entry, though, to people that it might have kind of been closed off to in the last three years? Yeah, so yeah. you're saying like, you know, maybe like Coinbase or someone simplifies uh, the ability to get in. I think that will actually dramatically increase the number of people that participate, but that will also flood the amount of work that comes in. So these sort of, um, you know, astronomical prices that we see, um, I think may actually come down as we expand the number of people that can use it, which also I think kind of plays into um, being like less fetishistic about the technology and more just open to the idea of that art just as much as uh, digital art, just as much as analog art could just be something that people collect, I think. But the old stuff, I mean, I would say not, not financial advice, but like there are some of the older NFT like works, I think will always be sort of um, hold some value because they're tied to sort of where this all started and began. So I don't know, I think we see this in the traditional art market too, when things start to get rocky, there's like a, a flight 
to like you know older historic works and, and that, you know again buy what you love um, but if you're thinking in terms of investment I think there's probably there, you know you're going to be a little bit safer if you go into some of the older work my opinion not financial advice not financial <laughs> advice <laughs> okay well thank you so much I think we're at time um, thanks Kate I'm so sad you couldn't join us but it was great to have you virtually thank you Jason thank you Ryan thanks everyone thanks thank everyone you.